that deserves a round and sound amen. I'm sipping water this morning because I shouted too much at the silent rally yesterday. Uh, there was a sil it was a silent march, but when we got to the state capitol, we sang and we shouted, and I shouted too much. And for those of you who know anything about vocal cords, vocal cords have to be moistened before they are strained. And if, think about it now, if, you, if, you ha, if, you're, if you're a woodwind player, the first thing you do before you blow your instrument is you moisten it, okay? The vocal cord is like a woodwind. If you don't moisten the vocal cord before you've been to strain it, you get what I have this morning. And so I'm not drinking this for homolytic effect. This is not for dramatic effect. This is for my comfort. I actually need to drink this water. So if I stop every few moments and take a sip, it's because, and Reverend James, you know where I'm coming from, it's because I'm struggling to be heard right now. <laughs> Let that be a lesson to you next time you go to a silent march and you get caught up in the moment and you become a song singer loudly. A word to those who can't breathe. I can't breathe. When compassionate people hear those words, we rush to the victim. We loosen collars. If there is reason to suspect that food is lodged in the person's throat, the Heimlich maneuver is performed. When we hear someone say, I can't breathe, and when we see someone appear to have trouble breathing, we rush to help. We rush to help because we know humans can't survive without oxygen. Although the human brain makes up less than 5%, or takes up less than 5% of our body weight, our brains require 20% of our body's oxygen need. Decrease of oxygen to a part of the brain is called cerebral hypoxia. Say that with me, cerebral hypoxia. When oxygen is cut off from the entire brain, the term is anoxia. Say it, anoxia. When oxygen flow is completely cut off from our brains, anoxia, we lose consciousness in 10 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, you're out. Brain damage depends on how long we're without oxygen. If oxygen flow is completely restored momentarily, people usually make a full recovery. But the longer the victim is in an unconscious state, the lower the chances for recovery are. Because brain cells begin dying, begin dying after four to six minutes without oxygen about as long as I've been talking to you in this sermon. This is why performing cardiopulmonary resuscitation, what we call CPR, on a person who can't breathe is so important. That is why we call 911 when people say, I can't breathe. People who can't breathe die without immediate help. 
I can't breathe, were the last words Eric Garner gasped as Daniel Pantaleo of the New York Police Department choked him from behind and as other officers tackled him on July 23rd of this year. I can't breathe are the words we hear on the video that's gone YouTube viral that was filmed by an onlooker as Eric Garner was assaulted by the police on Staten Island on July 23rd. I can't breathe is what Eric Garner said 11 times. I can't breathe. 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 I I can't breathe was Eric Garner's desperate last struggle to be treated as a child of God. Meanwhile, Officer Pantaleo was choking him. Meanwhile, another police officer was pressing his knees onto Eric Garner's torso. Meanwhile, other police officers were tackling him. Meanwhile, a police supervisor, a black woman, was standing by watching. Their collective responses to Eric Garner's gasp for help, his I can't breathe, amounted to we don't care. They didn't treat Garner's cries for help from a, as a cry from a suffering person. They didn't protect or serve him. Eric Garner wasn't treated like he mattered to his wife, now his widow, his children, now orphaned, to his community, to humanity, or even to God. Eric Garner was treated by the police, people sworn to protect and defend life as a threat, simply because he was big and black and standing on a Staten Island sidewalk and because the police claimed he was selling loose cigarettes. The police killed Eric Garner. Other police watched him suffer and die without doing anything to stop their colleagues from helping him. Who do you call when 911 shows up and stands by and watches you die? A Staten Island grand jury recently refused to charge Officer Panaleo with a crime for choking Eric Garner to death. When other people, when you and I choke our neighbors to death, we call it murder. When a policeman chokes somebody to death, the grand jury says it's business as usual. Ordinary course of business. Justifiable homicide. Eric Garner was an unarmed man, an unarmed man who could not breathe, was choked to death, and it's called no crime. But Eric Garner's death and the official response to it is not just one notorious tragedy. His death actually amounts to and represents what is happening across the world in the ordinary course of business. 
In the ordinary course of business, Palestinians are being killed and starved and robbed and otherwise brutalized as a matter of official policy by the Israeli government. Palestinians are saying, I can't breathe. And the United States is doing nothing to help them, but is instead actually bankrolling their oppressors. U.S. corporations are making profits by selling equipment and services to the Israeli government so the Palestinians can't breathe. Every day, Palestinians are saying, I can't breathe. We watch it on CNN. Can we hear them? Will we help them? In the ordinary course of business, wealthy people decided to sell cars they knew were defective that had safety defects. Cars they knew would maim and kill people if they did not work the way they were supposed to work. Every day, people who've been killed and their surviving family members, every day, people who have been maimed and wounded and left grief-stricken from the defects of those cars are saying, I can't breathe. Can we hear them? Will we help them? In the ordinary course of business, agents of the U.S. government tortured people. We found out about that this past week. What should we've always known? We've always known. Somebody was doing horrible things to other people in our name. In the ordinary course of business, people are being held hostage in Guantanamo, Cuba, who have never been charged with the crime and who will never be charged with the crime. In the ordinary course of business, innocent civilians are killed and maimed every day by U.S. drone attacks. Every day, the tortured and captured and killed and maimed people and their families are saying, I can't breathe. Can we hear them? Will we help them? In the ordinary course of business, black and brown men and women and children in Arkansas and elsewhere across the United States are racially profiled as criminal suspects just because they are like Eric Garner standing around, or like Trayvon Martin walking around, or like Michael Brown walking around. In the ordinary course of business, they are stopped and frisked and humiliated and insulted. In the ordinary course of business, they are beaten and shot and electrocuted by tasers and chemically assaulted by tear gas and pepper spray. Every day, people of color in the United States are saying, I can't breathe. But who is them? Who will help them? In the ordinary course of business, children from families from modest incomes who attend public schools in rural and public communities are receiving substandard education. Every day they're gasping and saying, I can't breathe. My teachers don't care. The school district doesn't care. The patrons don't care. The system doesn't care. Can we hear them? Will we help them? In the ordinary course of business, the regular course of business, people in power are refusing every day to finance early childhood education. Yes, in this state. And every day in the ordinary and regular course of business, these people and their functionaries in government are working to build new prisons and new jails while these people are saying, I can't breathe. Next month, the Arkansas legislature comes to town and 
you can bet that there's going to be a proposal to build a new 1,000 bed prison somewhere. Let me help you put the numbers out. A 1,000 bed prison is going to cost somewhere close to $100 million to build. Meanwhile, we refuse to finance early childhood education for children. I can't breathe. Every day in the ordinary and regular course of business, men and women, boys and girls who are gay and lesbian and bisexual and transgender are being oppressed. Children are being bullied and shunned and otherwise mistreated at schools. Workers are being fired from jobs. Families are being evicted from places where they live. And every day, these children of God are saying, I can't breathe. Can we hear them? Will we help them? Meanwhile, in the ordinary course of business, other people who are privileged in our sexual orientation and gender identity, including some who claim to love God, are claiming it is right to discriminate against others based on sexual orientation or gender identity. I can't breathe. Lest anyone forget, in the ordinary course of business, the world's drug manufacturers and the governments that allow them to make profits stood by as the virus we know as Ebola sickened and then infected and then spread as an epidemic across Sierra Leone and Nigeria and Liberia and other nations within the continent of Africa. Had that happened in Europe? Well, it wouldn't have happened. Every day the victims of Ebola and their surviving families and caregivers are saying, I can't breathe. And every day there is something less than a 9-11 response. These atrocities and these injustices are not aberrations. These are the ordinary and everyday course of business across the world for people who can't breathe. We talk about having compassion for the homeless at holiday time, but every day homeless people can't breathe. Every day homeless people are looking for a place to eat. Every day homeless people are looking for a place to stay. Every day homeless people can't breathe. It's not an aberration. This is the ordinary course of business. These I can't breathe atrocities and injustices are moral and ethical issues that challenge our faith in the love and justice of God. We wonder how God can breathe in the face of such pervasive and systemic injustice and suffering. We wonder what God is doing to bring deliverance and justice for those who can't breathe. And then we turn to the word we read this morning, Isaiah 61. And Isaiah 61 answers our concerns. There, an anonymous figure, we don't know the name of the person who is speaking, anonymous person declares that he or she, and because it's anonymous, I will not say it's a he. You understand? By definition, anonymous means I don't know who, and therefore I don't know what gender. Okay? So I will not rush to assume that that person is a male just because I don't know. Unless, of course, I suffer from the condition called male privilege. And therefore, I would presume that it had to be a man just because, well, it just had to be a man. An anonymous figure declares that he or she has been endowed with the Spirit of God and anointed to proclaim good news to the poor and downtrodden. This anonymous person has been commissioned to proclaim the jubilee year of release from bondage for all who are enslaved 
and oppressed. These good news, that's what gospel means, these good news words were originally intended for Hebrews in Judah who suffered the effects of Babylonian oppression and power, but they apply to oppressed people everywhere and in every age. And the good news for people who can't breathe is that God sees. The good news for people who can't breathe is that God knows and God cares and God is acting to overthrow oppression and to liberate oppressed people. God sees every Eric Gardner situation, including those that go unreported, unfilmed, unrecognized, and unobserved and unattended. God knows the anguish and the sorrow of every wounded soul and every victim of injustice everywhere. God cares that the ordinary course of what passes for business in our world is strangling the powerless and the vulnerable to death. God cares that violence and viciousness has become our regular and ordinary course of business instead of justice and mercy. God cares that people who should be performing physical and social and economic and emotional and moral CPR in the world are instead using their power and their privilege to help compress the throats and the chests of people and a creation choking to death. Global warming says the world can't breathe. All the choking and strangling and suffering and grieving we see and feel and know and tolerate offend God's love and God's justice. It's a stench to God that people who claim to believe in love and justice will march for the unborn but won't move a muscle to save living people who can't breathe. It's an outrage to God that people who swear to protect and defend life use power and privilege to abuse and slay their helpless brothers and sisters. God is furious when a nation that claims to be the leader of freedom and peace in the world on one hand enables genocide and viciousness against the Palestinians and racial profiling against its own people and then drones people to death we lead the world in bombing, folks. While we claim to be the leader of the world in freedom and justice. It's an outrage to God. So Isaiah 61 shows us that God cares and God sees and God knows and God is acting in response to the I can't breathe gasp in the world. Isaiah 61 also shows God's response to the plight of a world trapped in a stranglehold of violence and hate and systemic injustice and oppression. Unlike the imperialistic responses that people get so fired up about with patriotism, God's response isn't to train a new army of killers. God isn't response, God's response isn't to, to robbery, isn't to create a more religious order of robbers. God's response to robbery is not to create robbers carrying Bibles and crosses. God's response to violence is not to create killers carrying the cross of Jesus singing, just as I am without one plea. God's response to the toxic realities and the threats of evil and injustice isn't to let loose a religious version of the CIA, the NSA, the FBI, or the KKK. Instead, the divine response to and the divine remedy and deliverance for people who can't breathe and for our strangled world is the power of redemptive love made personal. The reality of redemptive love made personal is what we read about in Isaiah 61. Look at it and listen to it. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. When I took grammar, me was called a personal pronoun. 
The Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news, to bind up, to proclaim liberty and release the year of the Lord's favor and the day of God's vengeance to comfort all who mourn. God performs CPR on God's strangling children and God's strangled creation by empowering persons, persons as counteractive agents of divine love and liberation and justice and peace. And this good news of redemptive love made personal is summed up by the life and ministry and crucifixion and death of Jesus Christ. The good news of God's redemptive love made personal is what Jesus presented to the world and now calls you and me to embrace. Jesus calls us to be divinely appointed agents of redemptive love made personal. Jesus calls us to confront and to counter the systemic and institutionalized violence and oppression that is choking people and the world to death. And Jesus calls us to do more than offer condolences to people who are being choked to death by the systemic violence and oppression that passes for the ordinary course of business. We are called to be more than religious funeral directors for casualties of oppression and injustice. You know, funeral directors don't do a thing to help people. They just dress up the dead and present the evidence for us to tolerate. No. God has appointed us to be messengers and methods of liberation and love and truth and mercy and justice and peace. And God has appointed us to be messengers and methods of divine judgment on the purveyors and the practitioners and the apologists of systemic violence and oppression. Finally, God promises that justice will triumph over oppression. Let me say it again. God promises, and God keeps God's promises. You know, you can take that to the bank, as they used to say on the old TV show. God keeps God's promises. Because of God's redemptive love made personal, those who can't breathe are promised, as we read, a garland instead of ashes the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display God's glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former pronouns. They is a collective personal pronoun. <laughs> Me is an individual personal pronoun. They is a group pronoun. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Generations of I can't breathe will be repaired by God working through redemptive agents made personal through God's love. And so, we have a promise but we also have a reason for the promise in the eighth verse of that passage. In the eighth verse, we find these words, for I, the Lord, love justice. I hate. I know people don't like to say God hates, but they also say God hates ugly. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Because God loves justice and hates oppression, redemptive love made personal will triumph over violence and greed and hate and fear. Because God loves justice and hates oppression, God will avenge those who are choked to death by agents of violence and hate and fear. Because God loves 
justice and hates oppression, God's people of redemptive love must not stand by as people and the creation gasp, I can't breathe. We must not be content with reading Bible lessons and singing hymns and praise songs. We must not and should not and will not be satisfied with symbolic prayer meetings and vigils, goodwill and fellowship meals, time-consuming and pointless meetings with politicians filled with political excuses and posturing other countless pretenses for peace and righteousness, while our brothers and sisters and children and the rest of creation are being strangled to death. So, as people inspired by the gospel of redemptive love made personal, in obedience to the life and ministry and crucifixion and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, let us do moral and physical and social and intellectual and economic and emotional and global CPR for those who can't breathe. You understand CPR is what you do. If you care about people who can't breathe in God's name and as people empowered to live out the gospel of redemptive love made personal, let us intervene and stop the officious and the officially sanctioned violence and hate and robbery and every other kind of oppression. And then those who can't breathe will see themselves and be acknowledged as, as we read in verse 9, people whom the Lord has blessed. They will rejoice in the Lord, as we read in verse 10. And then we will see the promise that we read in verse 11. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. Amen.